Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today during Suicide Prevention Week for this discussion about extreme risk protection orders um, and a tool as a tool to prevent firearm suicides. You're going to hear from a panel today of uh, myself uh, from the National Extreme Risk Protection Order Resource Center, Dr. Paul Nestat, a psychiatrist who works on ERPOs, as well as two of our amazing colleagues from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, Taylor Kleffel and Bill White. Um, th so AFSP is going to start us off today with a little bit of information about their suicide prevention efforts more broadly and why they work on extreme risk protection orders. I want to draw everyone's attention to the Q&A section at the bottom of your webinar screen. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to just go ahead and drop them in there. If we can answer them during our presentation, we will do that, but we've also set aside uh, 10 to 15 minutes at the end of our webinar for Q&A. And I'll also just add that this is a challenging topic that I know many folks attending the webinar have, have been personally affected by, so please be sure to take care of yourselves and step away from the screen if that's something that you need to do. So thank you all so much for joining us, and I am going to turn it over to Bill and Taylor to get us started. All right, thank you very much, Spencer. So um, if we can go to the first slide here and I will kick us off, um, next slide please, to give some context on um, <clears throat> why AFSP became involved on in our work on ERPOs on the advocacy side um, and how it fits within our larger firearm suicide prevention work. So just, Right off the bat, and obviously you'll get more information down the line here, but ERPOs are civil, not criminal orders issued by the court. They temporarily prohibit an individual who poses imminent substantial risk of seriously harming themselves or others from possessing a firearm. So AFSP supports the use of extremist protection orders or ERPOs as a tool to help prevent suicide when voluntary efforts to separate an at-risk individual from a firearm are unsuccessful or impossible. Um, so we do strongly urge temporary, temporary removal of firearms as voluntary whenever possible, but we really need a mechanism in place to keep those at-risk individuals safe when it's just not an option. So um, in that case, an ERPO fills a gap um, that currently exists for families who want or friends who want to protect a loved one who owns a firearm but who isn't able or willing to take those steps to ensure they're safe. So prior to 2018, red flag, flag or ERPO laws had been passed in just five states. Um, Florida gained national attention after introducing and passing an ERPO bill in the wake of the Parkland tragedy, which sparked a really renewed interest in these laws across the country. So at that time, even though it was a reaction to violence against others, AFSP started to receive a lot of inquiries from lawmakers and other organizations for our expertise and um, requests for support from suicide prevention perspective. And what we found was that studies on the existing laws in states like Indiana and Connecticut, who have had these laws in place for the longest, um, had recently published that showed their impact on preventing suicide. So we worked with legislators and stakeholders behind the scenes publicly supporting bills at our state advocacy events. Um, and from there, and I know we're focused on ERPOs, but I do want to mention some of the other priorities we work on. And these are all positions adopted after our ERPO position. And this is specifically important in states where ERPO laws are currently just not a realistic goal. So these include, in addition to what's listed on the slide there, um, prioritizing research, uh, education-focused legislation, voluntary removal initiatives, and lethal mean counseling and healthcare. So as far as the research, I just want to emphasize we really do need more data on which firearm policies are most effective in reducing suicide rates, which educational efforts are most effective in changing attitudes and behaviors around firearms and suicide risk, and how we can best bring these promising practices to scale. So as far as legislation that provides resources to create and disseminate educational materials, that includes publishing content, um, providing trainings, for example, in some states where um, training might be required for concealed carry permit, we like to um, advocate that suicide prevention be a core piece of that. Um, it also might include distributing gun locks to healthcare providers and crisis outreach teams, implementing tax, tax holidays or permanent tax exemptions to allow safe storage purchases. 
to have tax advantages. Um, some of our voluntary removal initiatives include options for temporarily storing firearms outside the home, which really varies by state and community, but it may include gun shops, shooting ranges, police departments, and special storage facilities. And then there's also um, some provisions that can increase participation in these kinds of activities. So creating exceptions and background check laws where laws might be stricter in a state like Washington so that at-risk individuals can tempor temporarily give their firearms to a family member or friend during a suicidal crisis. Um, and then we also work to increase the number of licensed firearm dealers and gun range owners that are willing to allow at-risk individuals to store their firearms by addressing any concerns around liability. And then a big one that has also received a lot of attention, especially in the past couple of years, are voluntary do not sell lists, which allow people to add their own names into the background check system. Um, so far, four states have implemented these laws, but um, you may be aware the bills have been introduced all over the country. Um, and then finally, laws or programs to mandate or encourage educating healthcare professionals about the importance of lethal means counseling and asking, do you own a firearm? You know, providing information about secure storage and things like that. So with that, that's just some brief context on AFSP's work. You can learn more at AFSP.org slash firearms policy. Um, but I'm going now going to turn it over to my colleague, Bill White, who's going to provide some more information about our work on the federal level. Thank you so much, Taylor. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, my name is Bill White. I'm Senior Manager of Federal Policy here at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, or AFSP. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of our federal uh, policies that we support to prevent firearm suicide, as Taylor said. Um, but first, I just want to touch on some um, anchors of why this is important, talking about why firearm suicide prevention in particular is such a core focus for us. Uh, in 2022, the most recent year for which we have certified data, data available, most suicide deaths were by firearm, in total 54%, and most firearm deaths were by suicide, in total 56%. Um, most suicidal crises are brief. They often last as short as 20 minutes. And if you can get to an individual, if you can speak to them, speak to them in that time, if you can separate that individual, ideally voluntarily, from a method of killing themselves, you can save their life. If an individual lacks easy access to lethal means, they will most likely not find another method of suicide. Um, but the high lethality of firearms poses a severe challenge here. Given how quickly firearm suicide may occur and how highly lethal it is, we place particular emphasis on this issue. And moving to the next slide, I just want to talk about our federal priorities in this space a little bit before moving forward. Um, like Taylor said, we work both at state and federal levels on supporting funding to prevent firearm violence, both generally and specific to firearm suicide prevention, given the high overlap there. Um, that often takes the form of supporting research. Um, supporting initiatives for individuals to either have easy access to a secure firearm storage device and supporting law enforcement and other agencies in implementing extreme risk protection orders. Um, when an individual is in crisis, if a firearm is securely stored, that might prevent access to that firearm altogether. That's especially true in youth suicide prevention. Um, even for the firearm owner himself, it can provide that extra couple of minutes that it might take to unlock that device. And in that time, that might uh, think to call 988, their life might be saved in that time. But when that has failed, when voluntary disarmament has failed, extreme risk protection orders provide the last best way to help save an individual's life. If an individual is threatening that they want to kill themselves and they are unwilling to voluntarily disarm, an extreme risk protection order provides law enforcement the ability to separate that individual from that firearm and in so doing, save their life. Uh, like Taylor said, that's one of many different initiatives that we work on to prevent firearm suicide, and ideally we would want that disarmament to be voluntary. Um, like Taylor said, that's why we work so actively at the state level on trying to allow for firearm transfer exceptions in emergencies when an individual is in suicidal crisis, or for an individual if they, for example, know that they're going into a depressive phase um, to enter themselves voluntarily onto a do not sell list which would prohibit them from purchasing a firearm, and only they could enter themselves onto that list. But when all of those efforts have failed, if an individual is in crisis, and when a firearm suicide is imminent, having an extreme risk protection order legal framework in place, allowing a loved one to contact a court, get a judge to sign a petition for an ERPO, and then have law enforcement separate that individual from that firearm, 
in an emergency when all other efforts have failed is vital. It saves lives. And that's why this is so important. So moving to the next slide, I just want to touch briefly on one bill in particular we worked on, given its relevance to the matter at hand. In 2022, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention was proud to support the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. This was bipartisan legislation at the federal level, which was written and negotiated in the wake of the tragic Uvalde mass shooting. Uh, in the wake of that mass shooting, both parties came together and agreed on the priority of preventing firearm violence in general, and in particular, mass shootings and firearm suicide. Uh, obviously, at AFSP, our focus was firearm suicide prevention. As a result of this legislation, $1.4 billion were authorized to prevent firearm violence generally, including firearm suicide. And this legislation also led to the creation of the ERPO Resource Center, who you'll be hearing from in just a couple of minutes. Um, as a result of this legislation as well, over $238 million has so far been awarded to states and other entities to prevent firearm violence and firearm suicide through the implementation of extreme risk protection orders and through certain other initiatives. And then finally, I just want to touch on the next slide on our continuing work. Um, as Taylor said, we really focus primarily on voluntary lethal means safety. Um, helping an individual to have the resources to save their own life if they know they may soon be at risk for suicide or during a crisis, again, through providing state-level exceptions for firearm transfers, through supporting federal and state initiatives to provide secure storage devices or community lockers where individuals can keep a firearm outside of the home, thereby preventing access to it during a suicidal crisis and giving that time to help save their life, but also supporting 988 and other crisis lines, like the Veterans Crisis Line, so that an individual in crisis has someone to call, somewhere to go, and someone to respond if they are in suicidal crisis. Um, and then finally, we work with a variety of different groups across the country, including firearm vendors, to promote lethal means safety training and the adoption of best practices to save a life, including helping individuals know the signs of suicide and helping individuals know what to do to help save lives and prevent firearm suicide. So with that, I just want to pass it over to the ERPO Resource Center, and thank you all again for being here. Um, with that, Spencer, I'll pass it back over to you. Thank you, Bill, and, and thank you, Taylor. So um, we are now going to dive a, a bit deeper into extreme risk protection orders. Thank you so much to Bill and Taylor for giving us that background and context of a little bit about how ERPO fits into a range of relief and interventions that might be used. So we are the National Extreme Risk Protection Order Resource Center. We were created uh, last year by the Department of Justice um, in order to support uh, states and local jurisdictions with implementation of extreme risk laws. Next slide. So I uh, always have the disclaimer as a grantee that we are funded by the Department of Justice, as Department of Justice's Bureau of Justice Assistance, um, which is a component of DOJ's Office of Justice Programs, which also includes the Bureau of Justice, Justice Statistics, the National Institute of Justice, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, the Office for Victims of Crime, and the SMART Office. Points of view or opinions in this presentation are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the U.S. Department of Justice. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Paul Nestat to share a little bit of the data and epidemiology about these issues, and then we'll really get into more of the mechanics of how ERPOs work. Thanks, Spencer. And thanks for reading that disclaimer. That's a slide that I didn't want to have to read out loud. Um, so I, I'm going to talk to you about, uh, about suicide, but I think it's worth putting suicide in the context of gun violence largely um, in the United States. As you heard from, from Bill already, um, gun violence is a large problem. Uh, obviously, it's a problem that's been growing in the United States, getting a lot of attention, but not many people are aware of the fact that the majority of gun deaths in the U.S. are actually suicides. Um, as you can see on the slide, of the about 50,000 deaths uh, to gun violence in 2022, uh, a little more than half of them were, were suicides, followed by homicides and other other matters of death. Let's go to the next slide. Talk a little bit about suicide. Now, I, I'm looking at the participant list here and, and see people that know this already, um, but for those of you that are not already aware, 
suicide has been a leading cause of death in the United States for a long time. Th this table sort of averages the last several years um, of data. Um, suicide had been the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S. for a long time. They were displaced by, by the COVID pandemic um, and are now around the 11th or 12th cause of death, um, but remain the second leading cause of death for young people in the United States. Um, there are more suicides than homicides, as we talked about before, um, and it's a, it's a manner of death that not only is very prevalent, but is actually growing in the U.S., as we'll see on the next slide. So this is just a sort of a, a summary of suicide rates in the U.S. over, well, most of the last 70 years. So those, those first few data points are decade by decade. You see there was a relatively high suicide rate following World War II until around 1987, um, which was also the year that Prozac came out, which might have contributed to a decrease in suicides over the next several years, down to an eight year in the year 2000, um, where we had one of the lowest suicide rates we'd seen in a long time. However, throughout the 21st century, the suicide rate has pretty steadily climbed almost every year, with the exception being around 2019, 2020, there was a little bit of a dip, like a 5% dip in the suicide rate that many of us in the suicide research world were very excited about, thinking that maybe we were turning around what had been a prevailing trend. However, in the next couple of years, the suicide rate climbed again. The last year that we have data available for, 2022, saw the single highest increase in year-over-year -year suicide rates. Um, and we now have a rate of almost 15 suicide deaths per 100,000 people in the United States each year, which is the highest the rate's been since World War II. Um, so this is a real problem that we're hoping to address. If we can go to the next slide. Some quick epidemiology on suicide. Again, I know a lot of people on this call are very familiar with the fact that, uh, for instance, uh, suicides among men are much more common than women. About 80% of suicide deaths are among men, largely with firearms. There's differences across the lifespan. Um, we see peaks of suicide death around age 50 in the general population, and again, in the very old, over 80 years old. Um, but of course, that that actually varies by race and ethnic group. Um, we, we see higher rates of suicide in younger people, in, uh, in Black Americans and also in Indigenous peoples. In general, we see rates of suicide higher in uh, Indigenous peoples and in, in white Americans um, as the highest groups. However, last couple of years, we've seen increases in suicide, specifically among Black Americans. Um, that actually consists of mostly firearm suicides, not increased in other methods of suicide, which maybe we can get into a little bit later. For now, let's go to the next slide, where we talk a little bit about method used in suicide. So th these numbers, I, Bill talked about this a little bit. I want to go into a little more depth on the methods used in suicide. As Bill mentioned, about 55% of suicide deaths in the U.S. are by firearm. Um, it's by far the most common form of suicide death, with second place being things like suffocation, hanging, which only make up about a quarter of suicides, as you can see on this table here. But, you know, I, I want to talk about this for a second, because we talk about 55% of suicide deaths being by firearm. It, it ignores sort of the the difference that that is from suicide attempts. So suicide attempts in this country are, are very prevalent. There's, there's maybe a, a 1.6 million suicide attempts each year in the U.S., 1.6 million. So it's about 50,000 suicide deaths, but 1.6 million suicide attempts. Now, most suicide attempts are by poisoning, which includes things like overdose, whether it's Tylenol or sleeping pills or opiates. Most attempts are by poisoning, more than half. Um, but fortunately, most attempts by poisoning are non-lethal. Only about 2% of people who attempt suicide by overdose or poisoning die. So 98% survive, fortunately. Now, firearms, on the other hand, only make up about 5% of the attempts in this country, but because they're so lethal, as Bill alluded to, 90% of firearm attempts result in death. Because of that, they make up more than half. They make up the majority of suicide deaths in this country. Now, firearm access, which we'll talk about today, can be dealt with in a variety of ways. You, you heard Bill and Taylor talk about some of the other policies that the FSP supports. We'll talk about ERPO today. Um, but I really want to emphasize that this is why the method available to the potential suicide attempter matters so much. Should we can go to the next slide? I'm not sure. I am. Yeah, I think this is an important slide um, to really talk about why that access to method matters so much. This is a slide that talks about the impulsivity of suicide. Now, suicide deaths are heterogeneous. Everyone who dies by suicide has their own path that they took to that. However, as an epidemiologist, I look at averages. And I like a study like this, which looks at 153 young people who made pretty highly lethality suicide attempts but survived to be interviewed later in the hospital. Simon's team interviewed these folks and they talked to them about their depression. They might have had a conversation about, you know, I know you've been maybe thinking about suicide intermittently over time throughout this depressive episode. But at some point, that ambivalence resolved. 
And the person actually made the decision to have an attempted suicide. And Simon asked how much time passed between the decision to attempt suicide and the actual attempt and found that the vast majority of them, it was very quick. 87% of them had made the decision and then attempted within the same day, 24 hours. In fact, 71% of them was within an hour. Half of them was, was less than 20 minutes. A quarter of the people interviewed said it was less than five minutes. A quarter of them said five minutes between deciding to attempt and then attempting. What that tells you is that because of the impulsivity and rapid thought to action pathway for suicide, the method right there available matters a lot. If what's in the bedside table is a bottle of Tylenol, it can be scary, it can be very dangerous, but thankfully 98% of people who make an attempt with, with those medicines survive. But if what's in the bedside table at that time is a firearm, the chance of death is very high. And it's also worth noting that people who do survive that index attempt, that first attempt, tend to keep surviving. Only about 6% of people who survive a serious suicide attempt go on to die later by suicide because it can be so impulsive and the method matters so much. We can go to the next slide. You can answer the question. So if, if firearm suicide is so deadly, who uses a firearm for suicide attempt? People who have access to firearms. These are two maps. On the left is the firearm suicide rate state by state. Darker shading is higher rates of firearm suicide. So you see states like Montana, Alaska, uh, I know. And on the right, the purple map are the percentage of households that have guns in those states, Montana and Wyoming and Idaho having something like half of all households with firearm access. Um, whereas, you know, places like, um, I don't know, New York has a very low firearm ownership rate. And then you compare those two maps, the places that have more firearms just frankly have more firearm suicides. Other studies have looked at it a little bit more individualistically. People that have access to a firearm in their home have 3.2 times the chance of dying by suicide. Generally, firearm access is as much of a risk factor as things like depression or family history of suicide, more so, in fact. And that's why I want to address it today. And we can start talking about one way to address it on the next slide, Jim. Spencer. Thanks, Paul. So how did we get to ERPOs and, and these being a tool today uh, to, to intervene when, when someone is at risk to themselves or others? So some colleagues of, of mine got together in March of 2013 after the tragedy in, in Sandy Hook to discuss what can we do to intervene and remove firearms from those who are a known risk to themselves or others. Um, they were wanting something that could be used to intervene, but that was also politically viable, something that they knew could pass in, in different states uh, around the country. And so they came up um, with the idea for extreme risk protection orders. Um, and there was already something somewhat analogous to these in Connecticut and Indiana, but they were also really modeled after domestic violence protection orders. And the idea with ERPOs was to create a civil process when someone is a clear threat to themselves or others where the firearms could be removed and to give judges clear legal authority. Um, the, the researchers that were meeting knew that there were situations where law enforcement or judges or clinicians wanted to remove firearms, but there was no legal authority to do that. And it is just so tragic to wait until a tragedy occurs before removing those firearms when the criminal process might get involved, right? And so they, they came up with this idea. Next slide, please. So like I said, ERPOs are modeled after domestic violence protection orders, um, which means that they're civil orders um, that have similar processes and are sometimes heard in the same courts. The petitioners are different for ERPOs than for domestic violence protection orders. So the petitioner is the person that files for the order or the one that goes to the court and fills out the form and says, your honor, this person shouldn't have their firearms because of X, Y, and Z. So in all jurisdictions with ERPO laws, uh, law enforcement can petition. And in many, many jurisdictions, family or household members, as defined in that state statute, can also petition. And in several jurisdictions, healthcare providers can also petition, which are which is also defined in the statute. The purpose of ERPOs is solely to address access to firearms, which means removing firearms that someone currently possesses, as well as making sure that they are prohibited for the duration of the order from obtaining any more weapons. Mm -hmm. 
And so um, ERPOs are reported into the FBI's NIC system for background checks so that if someone does attempt to purchase a firearm when there's an ERPO against them, then the uh, firearms seller would be notified that they are not allowed to, to buy a firearm and obtain more guns. There are typically two types of ERPOs, and, and each state statute is going to vary a little bit in terms of timing and, and what they're called, but there's usually, well, every state has a temporary, with every state with ERPA laws has a temporary order, which is usually good for one to two weeks. And then there's a final order that can last for up to a year. Um, and so we do see some ERPOs extended uh, beyond a year for good cause shown, but that's also going to vary by state what that process looks like. Next slide. So here we have the map of jurisdictions around the country that have ERPO laws. Um, these uh, states that have them are shaded in blue. 21 states and D.C. have ERPO laws. I will note that um, given the population density of where some of these states are, um, actually more than half of the population of the United States lives in jurisdictions with ERPO laws on the books. Um, these laws go by different names. So California's law is called a gun violence restraining order. Um, in Illinois, it's a firearm restraining order or a fro. You all might have heard these called red flag laws. We um, usually try to refrain from calling ERPO's red flag laws because We've been told that that language can be really stigmatizing and we would never want to do anything that, that could be stigmatizing. I will also point out that this map might not follow along um, political lines um, that you might expect. And I will note that it is unfortunately in the wake of a tragedy that a state uh, takes action to pass a, an ERPO law. So like Taylor said during her part of this presentation, it was following the, the Parkland shooting in Florida that Florida passed their ERPO law. And so we often see on a statewide level, tragedy begetting change. Next slide. So how does this actually work in practice. So the petitioner, which again is the person who um, files the paperwork with the court, um, the petitioner knows that there's a risk and they will file the temporary order with the court. And the respondent is the person who would be subject to the extreme risk protection order law. So the petitioner files the temporary petition with the court and then a judicial officer approves or denies um, that temporary ERPO. So you have that judicial officer, whether it's a judge, a magistrate, a commissioner, different judicial officers um, vary by stage of the proceeding and in and different states, they have different names, but you have someone reviewing that petition and making sure that there is, that the, the statutory evidentiary requirements are met to grant that temporary order. If the court issues the temporary order, then in almost every jurisdiction with an ERPO law, it would be law enforcement that would then take a copy of that paperwork and serve the respondent to say, here you go, respondent, there's been an ERPO, um, a temporary ERPO issued, you have to surrender your firearms, you have the right to go to court in this amount of time and uh, share with the judge your side of the story and why there should or should not be an ERPO. And then that final ERPO hearing is held where both the respondent and the petitioner can present any evidence that they have and share their side of the story. And then the judicial officer will determine whether or not there's sufficient evidence to issue that final order. And then when the, if, if it's granted, then uh, when the final order expires, whether that's in six months or a year, then the respondent has the right to have their firearms returned. In some jurisdictions, law enforcement will reach out to the respondent and say, hi, your ERPO is expired. You can come pick up your firearms. In some jurisdictions, the onus is on the respondent to affirmatively reach out um, to have their firearms returned. And then when the order expires, the background check system is updated so that the respondent can once again um, lawfully purchase firearms. Next slide, please. So why why would someone um, need an ERPA? We've kind of touched on this when we're talking about suicide prevention, but what are you looking at when determining whether or not an ERPO is appropriate in a given situation? 
So every state statute in terms of the factors that they're looking at is going to vary. But uh, at the National ERPA Resource Center, these are the factors that we um, really turn to when we're, when we're thinking about it as from, a, from an ideal perspective. So first and foremost, we're looking at threats or acts of violence towards self or others. You really want to focus on that behavior um, and, and whether or not someone is stating or, or clearly indicating that they're going to in, engage in some sort of violent behavior. We also look at whether there are patterns of threats or acts, whether someone has violated domestic violence or protection orders in the past, are there um, is there a history of convictions of crimes um, involving firearms? Is there a general history of violence? Um, has this person brandished firearms in the past? Is there ongoing alcohol or substance abuse? Or has this person recently acquired weapons? I will note that the bottom two factors themselves, ongoing alcohol or substance abuse, or recent acquisition of weapons, those themselves are obviously not reasons to get an ERPO against someone, right? Um, however, when you combine those factors with threats or acts of violence towards self or others, then we really see that risk increase. And so that's why we encourage folks to look at um, at the at both uh, at the totality of the factors here, right? And looking at the case and and what the individual is saying and their behavior um, in that larger context. Next slide, please. So like I um, have said, these can be used in threats of self toward self or others. Um, one thing you all may have noticed was missing from the previous list of factors to consider in an ERPO case was any kind of mental health diagnosis. Um, we know that individuals who have a diagnosed um, mental illness are more likely to be victims of crime than perpetrators of crime. And we would never want any sort of mental health diagnosis to be the reason why someone is being the respondent in an ERPO case. Um, if they have a, a diagnosis and they are making threats towards self or others, that's different, right? But just that diagnosis itself is not grounds to be uh, seeking an ARPO against someone. Um, it's really about those behavioral factors that we listed. And so we want to point that out. And then this highlights here some of the kinds of threats to others where we've seen ARPO cases being used. We've seen them being used in domestic violence situations, in response to threats of workplace violence or school shootings, and then also in response to community violence. And while we're talking about domestic violence here, I know I mentioned earlier that these were modeled after domestic violence protection orders. ERPOs and DVPOs um, are very different in that the petitioner in a domestic violence protection order would be the victim. In an ERPO, the petitioner can be law enforcement. And domestic violence protection order laws vary by state. Um, but the relief included in a domestic violence protection order is much broader than the relief included in an ERPO, right? Someone seeking a domestic violence protection order, that order may include a stay away order, a no contact order, a temporary child custody agreement, some sort of financial support. The ERPO solely addresses access to firearms. And so if there are any folks that are working with domestic violence survivors or any DV advocates on the call, just want to highlight there's a substantial difference in ERPOs and DVPOs and happy to chat with anyone about that offline, but just would never want someone to be seeking the wrong remedy for their situation. Next slide, please. So included in ERPO laws are due process protections. And when the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act was passed, um, despite those uh, due process protections already being in included in the U.S. Constitution, uh, the senators and, and folks negotiating uh, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act took what I call a belt suspenders and safety pin approach and also just included the protections in the Safer Communities Act explicitly. So the respondent has these rights included in an ERPO case if that jurisdiction is using federal funding for ERPO implementation. And the, the, the jurisdictions around the country that I have worked with are, are all including these due process protections and their work. So the respondent has the right to notice, the right to an 
an in-person hearing, an unbiased adjudicator, that would be that judicial officer we were talking about earlier, right? It's not just a petitioner saying this person should have their guns removed. You have that adjudicator looking and examining the facts and making that determination. The respondent has the right to know opposing evidence, present evidence, and confront adverse witnesses. The respondent has the right to be represented by an attorney at no cost to the government. Um, the respondent has the right to heighten evidentiary standards and proof, which mean not less than the protections ordered to a similarly, similarly situation litigate, and then penalties for abuse of the program. Um, every state's um, laws around um, making false statements to the court would kick in in ERPO cases, but many states ERPO statutes also include um, additional penalties if someone was to make fraudulent statements in an, an ERPO proceeding. So you kind of have that that extra that extra protections here included in ERPO laws as well. Next slide. So what do we know about ERPOs to date, and I've seen um, a couple of of questions in in the chat about um, ERPOs um, and and how are they they typically enforced, which we will get to as well. Um, there is great variation among and within states with regard to uptake. So some states um, are doing hundreds or more of these orders a year, and some states it's much less. Um, but we see a wide variety in terms of, of scope of implementation. Um, Maryland, for instance, has had ERPOs in every county around the state and other states that have ERPO laws, we see implementation um, more limited in terms of that geographic scope. We know that typically the petitioners of those filing are most often law enforcement. Um, even in jurisdictions where family members and clinicians can petition, it's still typically law enforcement that are doing that. Um, clinicians, though, are rarely petitioners, um, which means that the clinicians, like Dr. Nestad on here, are Dr. Nestad's the exception uh, potentially. He um, they they can file, but usually clinicians are contacting law enforcement to file for petitions. The research, though, regarding ERPOs is incredibly promising. We know from multiple studies of different states looking at different time periods that for every 10 to 20 firearms removed, one life is saved from uh, suicide. Um, we also know from descriptive studies that there are ERPOs being used in a variety of contexts like I just discussed. We also know that implementation and, and how much uptake there is really tends to be at the local level. And so having someone who really champions ERPO at the local level and helps bring together the different system actors that are a part of this, who educates folks is really key to having ERPO um, implementation on a broader scale. We also know that there are different models and we've seen a lot of different ways that that ERPO um, is, is being used in terms of what the infrastructure at the local level looks like. So we've seen, you know, detectives that are really spearheading this in, in King County, Washington. There's a firearms removal unit in the state's attorney's office that has a, an advocate present. Um, so it's just different models we've seen um, and happy to chat with folks um, after this webinar. Uh, we'll put our contact information there if folks have questions about what is going on 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 your state in your state, um, and what those different options might look like? I will also note that it's really important to have accurate data entry into um, the FBI's two databases listed here: the National Criminal Information Center and the National Incident Background Check System (NCIC) and NICS, respectively, um, so that you can ensure that a prohibited in individual is in fact prohibited. Um, and the FBI does have someone who does training and is able to assist jurisdictions in making sure that this information is going into those databases correctly. Next slide, please. So I think that it's really helpful to have some tangible examples of, of when this is being used, because I think it sometimes will defy people's expectations of what a case might look like. So this example came um, 
from uh, Kim Wyatt in King County, Washington. Um, and this example states, a woman filed an ERPO against her boyfriend after he had previously attempted suicide and now wanted to purchase a firearm. At the hearing, the couple came to court together, holding hands. The man had no objection to the order and was thankful that someone cared enough to ensure he did not have access to a gun during the suicidal crisis. And I think that this example really highlights that it's not always adversarial in these kinds of cases. Um, we often see ERPOs being used um, to de-escalate situations and not, not escalate them. And we often see respondents understanding why it's not safe for them to have their firearms at this point in time. I think this goes back to what Paul was talking about earlier um, regarding uh, that that quick window when people are are impulsive and how once that window subsides, um, that risk really decreases. Next slide. So going now um, to the clinician's role in ERPO, Paul, I'm going to ask you two questions if you don't mind me putting you on the spot. Um, yeah. First of all, I know that Bill and Taylor earlier were talking about ERPOs within a spectrum of relief. And so I would love for you to tell us, how do you decide when an ERPO is appropriate versus some of the other interventions that you might be able to take um, as a clinician? And are there any other examples that you might share about when an ERPO has been used successfully? Yeah, certainly. Um, I, I just actually, before I get started, just because there was a question in the chat that I answered typing, but I want to just bring to the rest of everyone's attention about clinicians and ERPO and whether there are obligations in certain states. And, and so Spencer has put here on the slide a list of states that uh, allow clinicians to ERPO. And in most of these cases, um, by virtue of that being an option for a physician, if they if they if they don't, it's sort of it's a missed opportunity, and in some cases might put be putting them at risk um, for malpractice. There's been a couple of situations where that's come up, um, and and I would just add to this list Minnesota, where clinicians can't file ERPOs, but there's a duty in the ERPO law in Minnesota for clinicians that identify someone at risk to notify law enforcement so that they can. But anyway, that being said, clinically. Uh, the, sorry, the decision whether ERPO is a, for clinicians is a clinical decision. So you're taking everything on a case by case basis, very um, personalized. You wouldn't want to make any blanket statements about about dangerousness. I can tell you in my own practice, when I have someone at risk, I'm I'm starting on the less paternalistic end of that spectrum. Some of the interventions that Bill and Taylor already mentioned. So it might be a conversation about safe storage, you know, especially if it's a child at risk and I'm talking to the parents. So just locking the gun up, which is surprisingly not as commonly done as you'd, you'd expect. Um, or in higher risk situations, out of home storage. So a lot of states like Colorado and Maryland have safe storage maps where you can find places that have raised their hand and said, we're willing to hold your gun for a while if you're in risk or if someone in your family is at risk. So these are places like, um, well, sometimes pawn shops and police stations, but often um, shooting ranges or gun stores, they're willing to do that. And that's excellent. Um, there's also um, other, uh, depending on your state law, other options you have, like maybe the gun can be transferred temporarily to someone else that you trust, um, you know, sort of brother-in-law across town. There are complicated issues state by state in terms of being able to make those emergency transfers. Taylor mentioned that AFSP is advocating for loopholes in those sort of background checks so that that can be allowed in emergency situations. Even then, though, um, you then sort of are shifting the responsibility of, of when to give the gun back to the person at risk to the hypothetical brother-in-law across town. How do they know when it's safe to give it back? What if that gun is, is is stolen or used in a crime? It's a little bit less legally clean, but it's less uh, paternalistic, which is good. So there's a, a range of options, um, but in extreme situations, if you have somebody that really um, is at high risk and is unwilling to pursue some of these other options, or those might not be considered safe enough in that particular case, that's when you might start thinking about the ERPO. And of course, extreme is right in the name of the law. Um, and those situations that can be really life-saving, Another situation um, that just I can tell you in, in Baltimore, we use them for is to help shorten hospital stays. Um, so if you have someone on an inpatient unit, so thinking of someone who might be suicidal and they're hospitalized on an inpatient unit and they're getting better and, you know, treatment is working and everything. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not really a binary. Someone's not either at risk of hurting themselves or not. Um, you might feel a clinician might feel a lot more comfortable having that person leave the hospital, continue their treatment outpatient if they know that there's not a gun in the house. So we've had conversations with patients um, where the patient has suggested, well, what if we get the gun out of the house or, or in combination with our family, we have a family meeting and say, okay, let's, 
let's file in our opponent situation, which might result in something like Spencer described um, with a couple that went hand in hand. Um, and that's often uh, a good solution. There's also more creative solutions that some you know, people that are on this call that are clinicians know sometimes kind of have to figure out a good creative solution. We had one patient who was actually, he had a gun on, and uh, but he was actually had been convicted of manslaughter. And so he wasn't allowed to have a gun, it was a legal gun. Um, but he didn't want to be ERPO because the gun was the most valuable possession he had. And he was not, not a wealthy man. Um, and so there was some sort of facilitation in helping him sell the gun before it was released by the, to the hospital. So he had the money, um, but no longer the gun. And he couldn't have bought a legal gun anyway in the future. So that wasn't ERPO. Then. So a whole range of interventions, ERPO being a really useful tool in the most extreme risk situations. Thank you. That is really helpful. Paul, and, and I think you touched on this, but even where clinicians aren't able to petition, they play a really, really important role here. Like you, like you. And in fact, that's often the case, even in states where clinicians are able to petition, like Maryland, um, it's hard. You need to go into court and do the paperwork and clinicians, they don't have, frankly, time or understanding of getting involved in those proceedings often. Um, and so I'm often suggesting to clinicians who come to me, well, why don't you ask the family member if they want to be the actual petitioner or law enforcement the petitioner using, you know, information that that, that you help um, facilitate the petitioning, even if the clinician themselves isn't the petitioner. And that can be useful. And in, in Baltimore, we have a great pilot program called the Gun Violence Navigators, where we have social workers that can be brought in by doctors at Johns Hopkins and now University of Maryland as well to help facilitate that and take over um, that role to be petitioners themselves. Thank you for that. And we could keep going, but I know we have a lot of amazing questions in the chat, so I want to get to those. Um, could we go to the next slide, Joe? So um, I'm not going to get into too much detail here, but I will just note that HHS has released uh, guidance regarding exceptions to HIPAA for ERPO. Um, and so there, um, there are protections for healthcare providers who need to disclose information regarding um, someone's risk in an ERPO case. And so you can use the QR code to get to HHS's guidance here. Um, if folks also need it, I'll put my email in the chat. Happy to share that with folks after the call. Uh, next slide. Wanted to highlight that ERPO.org is the National ERPO Resources Center's website. I've also put um, the link on here to AFSP.org's firearms policy. Um, that is their link, and we'll, we'll put both of those um, in, in the chat for folks to access, or we'll, we'll share them after the webinar. But this QR code takes you to ERPO.org, um, where you can access um, a lot of our resources and information, our state-by-state -state map, and there's also a training request form if folks have interest in additional training. Um, and then on the next and final slide is uh, Dr. Nestet's and mine's contact information. You can reach both of us if you email erpo at ghu.edu, as well as the rest of my colleagues that work with me and, and lead the National Urban Resource Center. But I know we have so many good questions. I want to go ahead and get into those in the time that we have um, left. Uh, Taylor, I believe there was a question for you about AFSP's one pager on ERPOs, if you don't mind starting us off. Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of want to answer this question two ways to make sure I cover what they're, what um, Stephen is asking. But um, for those, as far as like a watered down version, if you're talking about a watered down ERPO bill, no, because often the point of contention is around whether the firearm can be taken away immediately in ex parte emergency order. Um, and that is something that, you know, AFSP absolutely requires in a bill that we're going to support because otherwise there isn't, um, it won't be effective as far as preventing suicide. Um, but we do have a really great list, kind of a menu of options for like that's geared towards legislators. So it's not on that website, but it's something we share when legislators ask what they can do to prevent firearm suicide apart from ERPOs and it includes um, model language and things like that. So I'm happy to work with you and share that. Um, I can put the email for um, our advocacy office in the chat. 
um, please reach out to advocacy at AFSP.org. And this goes for everybody. And I'm happy to share some of that with you and see how we can support that. And I do just want to note too, we are working on some one pagers around secure storage options. Um, we have one that's just going to be dedicated to ERPOs and then another one that's going to be more about the education piece of it that will be posted on our website soon. So those should also be helpful in that, in that sense. Thank you so much, Taylor. Um, Paul, if you don't mind me asking you, there's a question here about what sort of interventions are recommended for suicidal persons or potentially suicidal persons in lieu of or in combination with an ERPO, um, like counseling, a clearance letter, um, what kinds of things, if you don't mind? Yeah, and that, that's a very big question, right? So it's, it's treatments for people at risk for suicide aside from this. It's worth mentioning the context here is that this is only one thing that can be done to prevent suicide death. I'm a psychiatrist, so I'm going to start by saying you want to be treating any potential psychiatric illness. So, I mean, this is intense in the broadest possible way. Treatments for depression include things that are psychopharmacological, psychotherapy oriented, lifestyle oriented, um, creating a support system, a safety plan is maybe the most important practical thing you can do with someone at risk. Safety plan, including things to help them identify periods where they're at risk and also um, at some point, a safety plan, question six, is about a safe environment, which might include um, firearm restrictions and kind of things. So there's lots of things you, you would do. Um, and it often depends on, on who the you are in this situation. So if you're someone's psychiatrist versus their, their spouse or loved one or teacher or uh, mentor, there's different sorts of things. Generally, if you're not a clinician and you're worried someone's at risk, maybe the most important thing you can do is, is help them get into care with a professional who can help navigate all of those different options to help save their life. But yeah, it's a very big question. But in, in, in essence, you should see lethal means access as an important part of suicide prevention, but not the only part. Thank you for that. Um, I see a question here about can states apply ERPOs to minors? Um, and this person's writing in from Oregon. I will answer that. And if anyone else wants to add anything there, feel free to chime in. Um, a couple of states like Washington, um, their statute explicitly includes information about minors being respondents in ERPO cases. Um, I will say that there are some other jurisdictions like Maryland and New York where it's not explicit in statute, but other materials published by the courts or the state police um, discuss how ERPO respondents may be minors. Um, a lot of that's going to be in the statute, but it also might be defined in the state rules of civil procedure or in other parts of the state law outside of the ERPO statute. So if folks have um, questions about that, um, happy to chat with them further. I think in the aftermath of the Georgia shooting last week, um, you know, where it was a 14 year old shooter. We know Georgia doesn't have an ERPO law, but I think that's a question we're getting more. So happy to to talk with folks about that. Um, I see someone else has a question about whether or not materials are translated into Spanish. Um, the ERPO Resource Center, we don't have any of our materials translated at this time. Some state court websites do have materials available in other languages, but happy to help connect you. I don't know if AFSP has, has anything else translated. In terms of ERPOs um, or firearms, not not at this time, no, unfortunately. We are working to translate all of our website um, to have Spanish options, though, so stay tuned, but not right now. I can say that a lot of hospitals do this on a case-by-case. -case. At Hopkins, uh, Dr. Catherine Poops has made Spanish language handouts um, about gun storage and safety and also about ERPOs. This is for use in pediatric settings, uh, RER. -E so oftentimes, um, these things are done on a local level. And that's maybe maybe for the best because so many of these laws vary in more than just the subtleties on a state by state level, as you've heard us referring to many times. So I encourage you to go to the National Ergo Resource Center's webpage because they have a state by state, like a nice map. You can click on your state and show you the specifics of your state's law, if it has. So, Paul, while you're going, there's another question here. Um, for urgent cases involving patients at high risk of suicide, can the approval process for an ERPO be prioritized and expedited? And is there a follow-up process from clinicians after the removal of firearms? That's, that's a great question. And I feel like I'm going to say this every time. It's going to depend on the state. But in general, 
um, the uh, the process is is made to be very rapid because you know whether it's suicide or homicide, it's by definition a, an, an acute risk. Period. So things need to happen very quickly. You wouldn't want to file a petition and then you know wait two weeks for it to be enacted. That's maybe um, might scare people off from filing them because there would be a danger during that. So um, I can just speak to Maryland because it's where I practice. Um, in Maryland, um, there there is an emergency ERPO that's put into place um, if it's let's say it's after hours on Christmas or something like that, um, and and that's put into place until the next business hours at which time, and so it's enacted immediately. Um, a judge approves it, or an on-call judge approves it, and then when there's sort of like business hours happening, it's trans it's turned into a temporary ERPO, which lasts up to seven days before there can be a real hearing for the final ERPO, but but in all those situations, in theory, they happen rapidly. Now, how long it takes the police to you know get to a home to, might depend on how busy the officers are that day. But in theory, it's pretty immediate. So expediting is is redundant in some ways. It's always expedited. And Taylor, I believe there was a question for you for folks in jurisdictions that don't have ERPO laws in place. The National ERPO Resource Center, we don't do any advocacy, but for folks that don't have an ERPO law in their state, um, how can AFSP be a resource there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, depending on what state you're in, um, you can start with your local chapter, which you can find at afsp.org slash chapter. Um, and from there, our office works with our chapters and advocates like you on um, the best way, you know, we might provide language for a model bill, we might help in identifying a potential sponsor. We certainly help with advocacy efforts from our office, whether it be for legislative meetings or we can help with sending emails and all of those things. So we do provide support, um, TA, if you will, on all of those things. So absolutely. Um, so either reach out to advocacy um, at avsp.org and we can get you connected with your chapter if you're not already. Um, and then also, Bill, could you put in the chat the avsp.org slash advocate um, link? That's where you can sign up to be an advocate as well. Um, and receive information from your chapter if you're not already an AFSP advocate. So um, overall, yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. I'm going to answer a couple more questions here in the remaining minutes that we have. But if folks want to keep putting questions in the chat, we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, there's a question here about whether sociodemographic information is collected for petitioners and respondents. Um, every state has different data and privacy laws regarding ERPO information, and so sometimes states have that information. Sometimes they make it available publicly. Sometimes they will share it with researchers for analysis and, and research. Um, I know like New York State has a really helpful dashboard with, with ERPO data. I don't know if it includes all of the demographic information, but um, the anonymous attendee who asked about that, if you have a question about a particular state, I'm happy to share um, that information. And Taylor, there's another question for you about law enforcement and whether there's any resistance um, from them. Uh, yeah, I, I please chime in um, if you have more information, but I, I know Colorado was where we had the biggest issue after that law passed because of a sheriff's association that um, in a certain jurisdiction that did not want to enforce it. And even, I mean, the law was I believe it was Colorado that was named after um, a law enforcement officer who had lost his life. But um, I think the reason I want to answer this question, too, is I wanted to emphasize that they're underutilized in so many states in general because there's just a lack of awareness about the fact that states have these options. So it's not so much the issue. Yes, it's happened, but that's not really, I think, what's preventing ERPOs from being utilized the way they could be. I think it's more about the fact that we need to really raise public awareness about what the process is, the fact that that process even exists, and who it's for. Um, and I really just wanted to make sure I mentioned that. So, but please, if you want to add anything to that. I will just note that I have, you know, seen and heard anecdotally some around the country, some resistance from from some law enforcement um, who have in several instances changed their mind once the ERPO law went into effect and they saw 
what a useful tool it could be to intervene in a given situation. Um, I know there was a news article published in May of this year um, about, I believe, a sheriff's um, department in Michigan who was originally opposed to the herbal law there, but then they saw what a resource it could be. Um, and I've heard that from a few other folks around the country anecdotally um, who might be opposed, but then once they see it working on the ground, um, might be more supportive. Yeah, and I've heard too, um, like from police officers in Florida, for example, what they did is a lot of times some of the resistance comes from just feeling like they don't know how to carry out the process and that there's no training or information provided. So that's another piece. And I know that you all do some of that um, in making sure. And in some states, they have specific officers or units that are trained on how to carry those out. And that's also really helpful. So I know we're at time. I will use that though to, to answer um, one of the last questions. Are schools and universities receiving this type of training? We have done some training, but we are always interested in doing more. Um, and we are available to be a resource to all of you and, and anyone else that you would like to connect us with. So please visit erpo.org. Email me at erpo at ghu.edu, um, or I'll put, uh, we'll, we'll share some other resources to the folks that um, came today, but we really appreciate you taking this time and we want to continue to support all of you and thank you all for your time today and your work in this space. Um, this has been a really, really interesting conversation and I'm, I'm really glad that we could take the time and space to do this today. I would just like to thank Paul and Spencer um, for providing the bulk of the information here and doing the heavy lifting. Um, I, this is going to be really helpful to AFSP folks, and I'm excited to share it out afterwards. So thank you. Thanks so much for having us. I'm, I'm racing trying to answer some of the questions in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks so much for having us, and, and we're both happy to answer emails too.